Welcome to Grace at the Fray, a podcast that explores the many dimensions of God's grace that we find at the frayed edges of life. Come explore how God's grace works to renew your life and send you on mission in His kingdom. Hello, beloved. Welcome to episode six of Grace at the Fray. And and happy Easter. He is risen. Christ is risen indeed. I'm really excited about this week's episode because it's a conversation about love. When I say God loves you, you'll probably have some mix of these three responses. The first is, meh, like, I don't really care about that and it certainly doesn't affect my life. The second is more doubtful, like, I don't feel like God loves me. And you could probably point to all sorts of ways in your life where you have evidence for that feeling. And a third response might be theologically confident, like, of course, of course God loves me. The Bible tells me so. But either you're constantly haunted by the meh and the doubt, or your confidence is actually in your theological knowledge about God rather than an intimate experience with God himself. Well, my guest today is passionate about helping folks not just understand, but actually experience God's love for them. And this isn't just a warm and fuzzy kind of love. It's a love that meets you at the frayed edges of life and propels you outward in God's kingdom so that your life is marked by love. So let me introduce you to my dear friend, Laurel Kale. She oversees the Mentored Sonship program here at Surge. Okay, time out for a quick promo. Sonship is a one-on-one mentoring program designed to help you truly live out the power of the gospel in your daily life. I'll have a link in the show notes for how you can get more information about it. And, and you know, I should probably do an entire podcast episode on this because it is such a fundamental part of the DNA of Surge. But for now, I want to invite you to join me and the rest of the Renewal team at this year's Sonship Week coming this October at Park Road Presbyterian Church in Hollywood, Florida. It's right by the beach, just saying. This conference is an extended retreat to bathe your heart in the Father's love. It will include transformative teaching, deep worship, honest small group discussions, and personal mentoring, all based on the Sonship curriculum. Join me. It's going to be, it's going to be fantastic. Go to surge.org slash sonshipweek for more information. Okay, all right. Time in. I know Laurel would approve of that message. Before joining Surge in in the renewal department, Laurel served as a missionary with crew for 38 years. 15 of those were overseas in communist Poland and then 14 in Moscow. She first met Surge staff at a Sonship conference in Moscow, which impacted her life at one of her lowest points in ministry. From there, she used her furloughs to study at Philadelphia Biblical University, where she got her master's degree in counseling. Laurel loves developing people especially those serving in difficult parts of the world. She is wise and full of joy. And it was a pleasure, such a pleasure, to hear her talk about God's love. But as we jump in, I want you to hear a passage from Isaiah 54 that she refers to throughout our conversation. And I want you to find yourself in this passage. So take a deep breath. This is God's word. Sing, O barren one, who did not bear... Burst into song and shout, you who have not been in labor. For the children of the desolate woman will be more than the children of her that is married, says the Lord. Enlarge the sight of your tent and let the curtains of your habitations be stretched out. Do not hold back. Lengthen your cords and strengthen your stakes. For you will spread out to the right and to the left. And your descendants will possess the nations and will settle the desolate towns. Do not fear, for you will not be ashamed. Do not be discouraged. For you will not suffer disgrace. For you will forget the shame of your youth and the disgrace of your widowhood. You will remember no more. For your maker is your husband. The Lord of hosts is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer. The God of the whole earth he is called. You nervous? Oh, a little bit. Isn't that funny? Yeah. It's like you, you put a microphone in front of someone. It, it, like someone will say, hey, play a song. You you play guitar, play a song. And I'm like, I don't know any songs anymore. <laughs> I don't know any songs. <laughs> Just they're all gone. They're all gone. 
yeah, you put a you put a microphone in front of somebody. Hey, talk about stuff. Yeah. Boy. <laughs> so, I know. Yeah, there's you, yeah. you, you nervous. Um Well, you're easy to have a conversation with, so. Well, thanks. Well, hey. Welcome. Uh, thanks, Jim. <laughs> welcome to the the it's under construction, but it's it's getting there. It still. looks great. Yeah. It's got your favorite painting in it. Yeah, it does. Rembrandt's Prodigal Son. Yeah. It's got one of my favorite. Well, I guess that is one of my favorites. That's why it's in my office. Yeah. Uh, also, Starry Night, which I'll tell you that story some other time, why that's one of my favorites. Uh, I stood in front of, in in the MoMA. Nice. Every time I go, I'll just kind of stand there, and Lori just makes fun of me, and she takes pictures of me look as I stare, <laughs> and she's like, look at yourself. And I'm like, yeah, it's yeah. Anyway, um, that's what art does. Yeah, yeah. I love how you use art in in your sonship appointments. Yeah, but I'm getting ahead of myself. Who are you? Yeah. <laughs> what do you do for search? Hi, I'm Laurel Kale. <laughs> <laughs> Saying this to my longtime friend Jim Lovelady. <laughs> right. I work with Surge. I uh, head up mentored sonship which is taking the gospel from here to here, helping people uh, do that. And I head up the team of mentors, about 20 mentors, um, Jim being one of them. You're my boss. Yeah. <laughs> You're one of my bosses. Yeah. I have, one of I have so many bosses around here. <laughs> Poor Jim. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But I really love what I do because I get a front row seat to transformation in people's lives. Yeah, the sonship coaching is what changed my life back in 2006. And I mean, it really, it, when I came off the field, it was the sonship curriculum that reoriented my understanding of who I am, who God is, what God is like, you mm -hmm. know. And so I look forward to talking about a lot of those things because what you are heading up had a, has had a significant impact. And so now both of us get to do that uh, with soon to be missionaries potential missionaries uh coaching burned out pastors coaching uh missionaries so front row seat it's fun <laughs> yeah yeah so where have you recently been yeah uh, doing sonship coaching yes we had sonship week with uh some partners called in life in the czech republic i love the stories in a, a short amount of time <laughs> So much happened while you yeah. were doing Sonship Coaching, uh, doing Sonship Week. What is Sonship Week? Yeah. And what does it look like? Because we do it all over the world. Yeah. Sonship Week is just uh, the basics of what we share in the Mentored Sonship course, uh, kind of combined uh, and put into five days, the 16 lessons, not all the lessons, but uh, the major ones. And then there are small groups where you process what you've heard in the talk, and uh, you can sign up for one-on-one uh, -on -one mentoring with uh, mentor who has uh, been through sonship and taken people through sonship. Yeah. So uh, our friend um, Emily and I went and we were mentoring people um, during the week and we each both spoke once okay. one of the main uh, messages. So I was the first one up and Emily was the last one up. <laughs> So the first one was on God's confident children, uh, just about the lavish love of the father for his children and learning to live as beloved sons and daughters. Um, he joys over us with mm. great and loud singing mm -hmm. <laughs> because he's delighted in us uh, much more than we understand. And so a part of why I love doing sonship is, uh, like uh, Tim Tim Keller says, if you if you want a soda and you put some money into the uh, soda machine and it, it doesn't come out at the bottom, what do you do? Well, you hit the side right, right. of the soda machine, and uh, we all have good theology in our heads, like we would never say. Um, God doesn't love me. You know, we would we we know that he does, but we functionally live right. out of something else. And so what Sonship does, uh Sonship Week, is it does this to take the to help the coin drop 
our good theology coin drop to our hearts right. and then out from us. So um, that's why I love uh, mentoring people through Sonship. Um, it's why I love uh, doing Sonship Weeks, uh, Deception Lab, which we won't talk about today, but I'm sure you will sometime with Mark and others. Yeah. So. Yeah, it's all those. Yeah, these are all the various things that the renewal team does to be continually trying to connect the the truths of the gospel with our experience, and and that disconnect is so real on a regular basis. Right. You know, but then when you really pause and you go, okay, well, let's let's actually explore how you. If I said, "Does God love you?" Uh, you would say, well, yeah, of course. Of course God, lo- God, God loves me. Um, well, our lives don't always live that out, right. you know, and the way my emotions will get ahead of my theology so often that, yeah. that my, my emotions are actually communicating the things that I really believe in this moment. Right. Even though if I paused, I'd be like, oh, yeah, I don't believe that. So sonship is very much this, hey, hey let's pause and look at that moment. What is that? What were you believing in that moment? Yeah. So you were doing that with 90, 90 folks in Chechia where Serge has some church plants. Yeah. And we were working uh, with this other group that we've worked with, I think, for five or six or seven years. And um, they have a, a uh, national ministry with college students and young uh, professionals. So we were working with some of the people that they work with, and there were some people there who uh, probably weren't uh, believers. And maybe we heard that the babysitter who was doing child care came, came to Christ, that oh, week, which, is really, which is really, which is really, really cool. That. I know, I know, because, um, you know, they needed child care, and so they just hired somebody, and uh, she was mixing it up this... Um, and the Czech uh, Republic is uh, really highly atheistic, mm. um, a rich Christian history there over the years. They had the first uh, reformer, um, John Huss. Right. But yeah, the Moravians uh, come out of there. Yes, yeah. yes, 100 year prayer movement. So, um, yeah, I mean, now. Uh, the legacy of uh, communism is is really strong, and um, so that's what's so thrilling about these young people that are coming to Christ, and they really are in fire. And God did something very specific in a lot of their lives. We always end the week with prayer time for people, and uh, we split into two large groups, and then somebody um, would ask for prayer about something specific that they wanted to see God transform in their lives. Then we'd put them in the middle, and we'd uh, gather around, and we'd pray for them. That went on past uh, midnight. I mean, they were just really confessing their sin and asking for prayer, and it was it was really fun to be a part of that to see the Lord work. That's amazing. I I love that that when when people are like, "Hey, let's get together and pray." Oftentimes, it's kind of like, "Okay, all right," but when their spirit really begins to move, and people start to just open themselves up to what the Lord is doing in those moments. And and how can you tell? Well, people are like confessing things openly and publicly that's like, oh, wow. Wow. And in in that moment, maybe in some other context, you might be like, oh, you're, ooh, I'm going to be judgy on you. But in this moment, when the Spirit's moving, it's like, oh, no, I'm like that too. Yes. Oh, I, that's, that's me. And then suddenly... Yes. This one person becomes us, and we're all confessing our sins together, and the Spirit moves. And that's, I mean, there's been a lot of conversation about revival lately, but basically what you just described is a little 90-person revival, and who knows what kind of uh, work the Spirit can be doing. That's, that. that's exactly right. You know, one of the things that really, I think, touched me um, the most, um, because I... Um, love um, Eastern Europe, and I have lived in parts of it. Um, And one of the things that touched me the most... You've been a missionary for a long time. A long time, yeah. We'll say it that way. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) That's right. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) Um, 
There were several single women who came to me afterwards and said, um, you are the only sing, uh, older single woman who is walking with Jesus that we know. What? Why? Like what? Yeah. That's the legacy of um, communism. I wow. mean, it's atheistic year upon year um, where their, you know, the grandmothers in uh, uh, Eastern Europe who walked with Jesus are now all gone. Right. And so it's their children who may or may not have ever come to know Jesus um, and their children and children's children you know so it's been passed down so yeah the the holy spirit really needs to stir things up in there which is what was so fun to see but what you know what it was for me personally being single for all these years never married was to hear those young uh lovely czech women you know, say who are really uh, doing a wonderful job discipling people, mm. seeing people come to Christ. You know, um, they're giving their lives to that, and to have them say, "You're the only older single role model we have." It was really humbling, and it was kind of like I said, "Okay, Lord, I'm in. <laughs> I'm in with all of the pain it's been to be to be single for years and years." You know, uh, this is one of the things that one of the fruits of what you've done. You know, that helps the next generation. So, yeah, that's it's remarkable how that was even a thing. You know, that yeah. had, that was said. Yeah. You are the only yeah. single woman. Yeah. who we know um because this the attrition i guess has been right. so significant right uh that as they're trying to walk with jesus they don't know anybody That's, who do they look up to yeah you That's know exactly right. so there's that but there's also this beautiful and i love this because i've known you for a long time <laughs> and there's something so glorious about how the stage in life that you're in people are People are lining up, literally lining up, to ask your advice about You're so everything. Sweet to say that it's <laughs> it's because it's it's like there's data yeah. <laughs> to prove that 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 pastors are coming to you. The pastors of your church are coming to you and asking for your wisdom. And I feel like there's so much fruit mm -hmm. from a you know you, you you told me you were like this is. The, the, the idea of singleness yeah. has been a significant source of suffering throughout your life. Yes. And then so for this to be the fruit is just, there's such satisfaction. Uh, and, but I love it how, you, how you, you'll say in a, in a conversation, yeah, they came in, they asked me about what I thought about this. And you're, you're like shocked, you know, <laughs> which is like, exact, of course, of course you are. Um, but yeah, so talk about what that has been like because yeah, I am getting yeah. to see the fruit of a lot of of a of a long life of yeah. trusting Jesus. So talk yeah. about that long life of trusting yeah. Jesus in this way. Yeah, the big theme over it all is uh, being single. I I only wanted to be a mom and have a lot of kids. That was my goal in life, and the Lord had different plans. And um, the big theme over all of that is that um, I found Jesus at a probably much deeper level than if I had had my way and had a husband and many kids. And because when you're in suffering for periods of time, for a long time, the same same, same old, same old, you know, right. Lord, aren't you, are you going to bring somebody or not? Um, that's, that's a place of suffering. And yet, in suffering, we find Jesus. Yeah. Because where else can we go? Yeah. So, yeah, I kind of smiled when those women said that to me, those young women, because when I was in my 20s, I remember sitting on a hill in Poland, uh, reading Isaiah 54, 
which talks about the children of the single woman will be, or the unmarried woman will be more than the married woman. Mm. And uh, your maker is your husband. And and it was like the spirit whispered to my heart, this is you. This is going right. to be you. Your children will um, inherit nations. And, um, you know, will be more than the married woman. And I'm like, no! Right, right. <laughs> I don't want to be single all my life. No, please. No, thank you. Yeah, anything else. <laughs> Which is crazy that Isaiah 54 comes right after Isaiah 53. That's, and, oh, that's, that's a great point, Jim. And the suffering servant. Absolutely. You know, so like if you're reading through the, you're like, wow, Jesus is, Jesus entered into suffering in this profound way. Yes. Yes. Well, good for him. I'm glad for him. <laughs> I'm glad. I'm glad that I get to enjoy that. Yes. Keep reading, Laurel. <laughs> Go to Psalm 54, and you're like, no, thanks. No, I don't want it. That I don't want this to be my suffering. Yeah. I don't want that. Yeah. yeah. As I look back at my life, um, I mean, it's it was hard at 29 because I knew up oh, 30s coming. You know, it was hard at 31 because I'm like up. Oh, I'm past my 20s. You know, the clock is 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 ticking. And then 40, 39, 40, 41 was really hard because I'm like, I'm not going to be able to have children. Mm. My biological clock is over, <laughs> you know, almost over. Yeah. So, and then uh, it got a little bit easier, but there have been moments where uh, it's... The one that was very surprising was when my closest friend started having grandkids. Threw me for a loop. I was not mm. expecting to struggle at that. But I didn't have any pictures to show of my grandkids to everybody right. when all my friends were showing their pictures. So, yeah. Um, but I, I really wanted to say to those women... Um, that came to me and said, you know, you're the only yeah. older single woman we know walking with Jesus. That, you know, Jesus has a great adventure that he's writing mm. in your story. Um, I don't know what that looks like, and I pray he gives you companions along the way, whether that's a husband or a church who will love you well or close friends. Um, but he, there is life after you know, singleness. <laughs> there, it, it's not a second-rate life. It's right. a great, right. great privilege to be able to um, be totally un, undistracted. And one of my one of my young friends one time, she was in high school then. She has kids of her own now. She's married, has kids. But she said to me, "You know, Laurel, if you were married, I wouldn't get so much of you mm. as I do now." And I'm like, "She's right. Yeah, she's right. Yeah." One of the things I really love about this conversation is that we, the church doesn't have a really great theology of singleness. And so whenever I get to sit with someone who has, you know, so going back to your talk was confident in God's love. Yeah. You're so confident in God's love that it's like, I can talk about this thing that's very intimate in my life right. of my struggle with yeah. being single is... Is a very it's a very intimate thing, and so that you that you that you would share that, I, I feel honored that you would share that. Um, but I but I think that it's this is just another fruit, hmm. uh, an Isaiah fifty fourth fruit, mm -hmm. because it's like hey, there are a lot of people who need to hear this. There are mm -hmm. a lot of people who need to be encouraged, not just these single women mm -hmm. in in Chechia who are who are coming to you going. You, you become this icon for hmm. what it could look like hmm. to follow Jesus. That's what your life is, and they see that. Yeah. And, and it, becomes, it becomes this beautiful example, icon, mm -hmm. a demonstration of you get to be an Isaiah 53 suffering servant, lowercase mm -hmm. s, mm -hmm. lowercase s. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's really, that's really humbling. You know, I... It, it hasn't always been um, something where, you know, oh, Laurel's doing great with her singleness. Mm. I mean, it's easier now, but there were moments when, like you, um, 
intimated just now there was great shame mm. in being single you know everybody else i was i was i was an oddity you know um if there was a seating at a you know table with a lot of people I had to make sure that I wasn't taking one space for a married couple, you know, who could sit there. Uh, so, okay, okay, pause. <laughs> because, you know, you do, it's like you don't think about those things. Yeah. And, and how you had to think about, not just think about yourself, you also have to, like, consider there might be a married couple. So there's a, there's a burden in that moment yeah. that is... That's profound. And so then you like take that one little moment and you multiply it by a lifetime. Okay. Yeah. I, yeah, I've never thought about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I could help you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 To see, you know, yeah. you saw married people in a, in a way that married people didn't see you. And that, that's suffering. Yeah. That's a, that's a little bitty yeah. piece of suffering. Yeah. I will say I have some friends that have uh, walked with me for 40, 45 years, you know, with this three married couples mm. um, that, you know, the men have uh, really um, affirmed me and, you know, Laura, I don't know why the heck you're still single. <laughs> You know, the women have loved me well and brought me into their family, so I kind of share their kids. You know, I'm their aunt. Um, every single needs that, mm. I think. Uh, families who will say, friends who will say, just come hang out, be part of our, you know, part of our group. Uh, can we call you aunt? <laughs> Can yeah. you come over for dinner? Yeah. <laughs> Just come anytime. You know, you need, we we need people like that yeah. um, to really help us. So cheering, cheering churches on and married, married couples well, to do well, that. Well, you know, have so, the courage. well, that's a great example of, hey, this is what you, you really can do this. And that's part of being the church together. Yeah. Um, so, hey, you can see a single person. Go see them. Look for them and then see them. I think singles crave normal life, you know. So going into what a married couple might think is absolute chaos, uh, maybe not every single loves that, but I would love that because I would, you know, feel like, well, this is what I always wanted and mm. I can just be a part of it, but then I can go home afterwards. <laughs> right. So, I mean, it's a special kind of thing, just coming into the mess you know just like god does with us in our lives he comes into our mess yeah um, yeah so tell me some stories of what what experiencing the love of god yeah as a yeah. single person yeah and it's not just like as a single person as someone who's like wrestled with and struggled with yeah the calling that you got the isaiah 54 calling Mm -hmm. you got okay well that doesn't mean that this is going to be a walk in the park there is hardship so yeah. tell me tell me stories of how you've experienced god's love in the middle of all that yeah that's been um the the gem in the suffering hmm. you know is finding um the father's delight in me or believing it more and more deeply um and finding Jesus, the man of sorrows, you know, who was also single, who knew what it was like mm. to be lonely, who knew what it was like to face every uh, temptation a single would face or a married person, both. Um, and, you know, there have, been, there have been some times, you know, especially when I was on the field, um, the mission field, where I was in um, danger you know, and, uh, or, you know, potential danger. And uh, suddenly, I was out of danger. Hmm. You know, um, one time, this is, <laughs> this is kind of a funny thing, but I was um, outside Moscow um, at a conference, and I had to go back to, like, leave the conference venue and go back to where we were, we were living, we were s sleeping. Because you were serving there. Yeah, because I was serving there. Yeah. And so I uh, started to walk back. And r like Russia has these packs of wild dogs. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Keep going. All right. And I was by myself. And this 
pack of wild dogs found me and surrounded me and started coming in closer and closer. Well, at first I yelled at him in Russian. Then I yelled at him in English. And <laughs> neither of those worked. Neither bilingual <laughs> nor... Right. <laughs> yeah. So then, then I like picked up a stick and tried to, you know, like threaten them. And that made them come closer and had this long fur coat on. Oh my with gosh. The hide outside. So they were literally nipping at my at my uh -huh. coat. And I was like, oh. And so finally I just threw up my hands and I said, Jesus help me. <laughs> and they started backing off. <laughs> oh my lord. It's, it's Laurel in the lion's den. <laughs> And they opened up a way, and I just walked through, and I was shaking, but I, I made it back, you know, home to where I was going to go. Oh, then my God. Told told people later, don't travel by yourself <laughs> on these roads in this forest, because... <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah. my goodness. So, I mean, there have been times like that. But I can totally picture this, this petite woman <laughs> who's yelling at dogs in multiple languages <laughs> and waving a stick and then you cry out to jesus and it's like silent yeah and yeah. The, the sea of wild dogs parts yeah and, and I, you walk that's, through it that's exactly the way it happened yeah oh my goodness yeah yeah it was it was crazy and there and there and there is your there is your savior there is your husband to protect you yeah yeah you know absolutely. and that's absolutely that's profound to me you know the stories that you've told me before where it's like this is where jesus meets you where in your greatest need yeah this is where um th this is where jesus becomes your rescuer mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. it, it's just it's profound yeah 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 one other time uh more recently than that one um and this you know this has had an a real uh deep impact on me and it just happened uh, the last couple of years like when covid first started there was nobody living in my house there have been single women living with me periodically on and off mm -hmm. but there was nobody at, the, at this time so i was by myself and my young friend said you're not um going out because we're worried about you with the pandemic so we're going to shop for you we're going to bring you know food by and so they were and i was really grateful for that i could see people and i was obviously from a on distance. zoom yeah from a distance six feet there was no you know there were no hugs it, we were masked um, I was on Zoom still, you know, um, for my job, for what I do, um, uh, mentoring. So the only contact um, I had with anybody face to face was when people brought me food, you know, brought groceries. And then there were no hugs, there was no touching, you know, and so I was starved for somebody to hug me and touch me and I realized how you know much that means to me mm -hmm. so I hadn't really been in touch with that but anyway um so of course I was complaining to God <laughs> and you know I mean I know families are having you know they're having all kinds of uh difficulties living in a close space and they're all kind of family fights and marriage arguments and all that. but I just want somebody here that I can yell at yeah, or you I'm know all just alone. Like, yeah I'm all by myself so um I was uh complaining for weeks about this and then it was like the Holy Spirit whispered to my heart once more you don't really believe that I can love you the way your heart longs to be loved. And I'm y like, yeah, yeah, you're right. <laughs> I mean, I had nothing else to say that he was true. I mean, it, he, his words were true. And so I said, well, you've, I started to pray then you've got to help me, uh, take what I know in my head mm -hmm deeper into my heart so that my unbelief more and more becomes belief that you really do love me. I I can't do that. I mean, I can tell myself and rehearse it and rehearse it and yeah. rehearse it, but to really take it deep into my heart, you you have to help me. You have to show up to help me. You think that that I love you in a way that you long to be loved, but you don't really believe it. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. You don't believe 
it, it's it's profound. You didn't say, I realized that I didn't believe. It wasn't that. No. It was it was and you know, how does this work? It's mysterious, right? It's it's not right. like there was an audible voice from heaven. Right. You don't believe. No, it was you don't believe that I can love you in the way that you long to be loved. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. That was my that was my reaction. I mean, all I could say was, You're right. Hmm. You're right. But you've got to help me because mm -hmm. I can't believe any deeper than I'm already believing, I think. You know, so you have to help me. So I, I began praying that for weeks or whatever. And one day I had to um, uh, do laundry. So I took a basket of dirty clothes down to the basement where my washer and dryer are. And I turned the corner and there in the middle of the floor was a dead mouse. So you're not a fan of like... <laughs> Animals? Rodents, <laughs> rodents and wild dogs. And wild dogs, that's right. Got it. <laughs> so, of course, I dropped everything, screamed, you know. Flipping and out. Ran upstairs. I'm like, oh, no, no, I have to. I'm the only one here, so I have to go take care of this uh -huh. mouse. So I got the, the broom and dustpan, went downstairs, s very carefully swept it up, you know, grimacing the whole time, carried it out grimacing, complaining to uh -huh. God. Uh -huh. the whole time took it outside got rid of it and went on with my wash well a couple days later i had to do some more wash so i went down to the basement turned the corner and there was another mouse in the middle of the floor <laughs> and i'm like no really really god so i I dropped everything and I'm like, okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna go get the broom. So I did and I started sweeping it up and it was still alive. <laughs> so ah, you flip out. More. So flipped out, dropped everything, ran upstairs and thought, I'm just gonna wait an hour until that thing dies and then I'm gonna go down and take care of it. Because there's nobody to do this here right. except me. So um, an hour later I timed it. I went down to the basement, and I couldn't find the mouse. It was nowhere to be seen. Mm -hmm. Still in the house I somewhere. I was like, oh, now I really do have to figure out who to call so that they will help me find this mouse because it's going to start stinking, right. and I've got to find it. So I turned around to go back upstairs, and the maker of heaven and earth had ordered that little mouse into the dustpan where it died in the dustpan and i started to weep hmm. i'm like you see me mm -hmm. you love me and you are the best husband i could ever ever have <laughs> i'm i believe more deeply now yeah <laughs> <laughs> that you love me. Yeah. <laughs> From the two mice, <laughs> two dead mice. <laughs> yeah. These, these, uh, it's a beautiful story. But like that's that, I love that story because it's where, where God goes, I'm going to be the husband. Yeah. I will, wh what is it in Isaiah 54? Ah, uh, your maker is your husband. The maker of heaven and earth mm -hmm. is your husband. Mm -hmm. and, and he'll take care of it. He He'll did. take care of it. Is there is there a man around here who could take care of this stupid mouse? And God's like, God's like, I'm that man. Yeah. Um. Oh, and by the way, I love you. Yeah. You know. And I see you. Yeah. 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 Stupid animals. <laughs> <laughs> it's <laughs> it's kind of funny. <laughs> so you told that. So you told that story in Brno. Yes. Yes. That's what I kind of closed that talk with that, you know, God, God sees us. God loves us. Um, he absolutely knows where we're weak, where we're needy, where we're bankrupt. We can't pull ourselves up by our bootstrings. Yeah. You know? So he wants us to be desperate, that desperate that we cry out to him and he loves those prayers. And it is a funny place where 
the Lord brings out our desperation. It's not like he forces desperation. He just kind of lets it happen, right? Yes. Uh, as you're walking through a forest in Moscow, <laughs> uh, as you're trying to do laundry in your basement, yeah. and you discover these different places of desperation. But you titled your talk, Confident. Mm-hmm. God's confident children. There's a response there, inherent in that word confident. Mm-hmm. There's, I am going to be a certain way, mm-hmm. versus God's beloved children, mm-hmm. which is true you know we are god's mm-hmm. beloved children yeah and there's yeah. something like warm and fuzzy and settle into that mm, uh, i love being your beloved right right i don't want to i'm kind of making light of it but i don't want to make light of that very real and right. true thing right but you titled it god's confident children yes so what is it about god's love that makes you confident you know just the fact i mean there's a lot that goes into that but that he sees me um and he he sees every one of us, mm. which when I start to think about it blows my mind. I can't even understand that. But that's God. That's our God. That's our Father. And um, as he has over the years, you know, shown up time and time and time um, again to be there in a way for me that nobody else has been able to. Mm. That builds my faith so that I am not worrying so much about, am I going to have money to pay the bills? You know, will um, this relationship work out or not? You know, Mm. all of those things. I'm able to more and more um, say, my father is going to take care of it. I don't know what it's going to look like. I may or may not like it. (laughs) Right. <laughs> but he's going to take care of it in such a way that if I saw what he saw, um, I would want the same thing. Right. Yeah. My father is good. He sees me. He's loving. He is very personal, very intimate, to use your word. Um, and there are some things, actually, that they're um, so intimate between my father and me, Jesus and me, that it, I can't find words yeah. to talk about. Yeah. But it's that intimacy that I long for, and he shows up and shows me over and over and over in different ways. I'm the best husband you could ever have. Mm. And then the fruit of that is when, not just stories of when you ha- when you found yourself dependent, but an opportunity to go be bold shows itself you know, I, there's this whole kind of prayer that that turns into of, Jesus, I don't want to do this, or yeah. Jesus, I feel like I, I don't want to do this by myself. You know, I'm thinking in particular, you called me a couple of weeks ago, and you're like, hey, you want to go do this conference with me in uh, Maryland, was it? Yeah. Was it Maryland? Yeah. Oh, I'm already going to be in Maryland for, for a conference. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. You know, oh, maybe so-and-so could do it. Maybe, you know, it's just, and it ended up just being you. Yeah. You know, <laughs> and, and it was like. That's exactly what they needed for that conference uh, was for mm-hmm. you to go in and do your thing. Yeah, I think and so. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. it's like, you know, we don't feel bold. We yeah. don't feel confident. But it's everyone around us that's just like amazed and yeah. blessed yeah. and humbled and convicted by yeah. by your confidence to to follow yeah. Jesus wherever yeah. he says, hey, you, hey, I want you to go to Maryland. All right, I'll, I'll, I'll take some friends. No, 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 just you. <laughs> well, and some friends. No, just you. <laughs> and not friends. No, just you and me. Yeah, yeah. And let's go. That's good. And then that makes me think about my, my call to uh, Moscow. Because uh, things had been, you know, I had made some trips to um, Eastern Europe, lived in Poland one year. But... Um, There was one day I was living with some friends uh, and loved living with them and their family. They had three little kids, and I love them to this day and love their kids. Um, But I was uh, sewing new bathroom curtains, and my phone rang, and it was my um, uh, crew supervisor, uh, Camp's Crusade crew, um, and I knew what she was going to say. And she said, Laurel, we are putting a team in uh, Moscow, Russia, because, you know, the wall has just fallen, the Soviet Union is, um, you know, disintegrating. And so we're going to put a team in uh, Moscow, and we want you to help lead it. And I was so scared. I said, 
I'm not going anywhere because I'm sewing new bathroom curtains. I'm I'm not going anywhere. I am staying. And hung up the phone. You hung up on <laughs> Great her? Great missionary call. <laughs> That's hilarious. So, so anyway, I called back and I said, I'm sorry. I just, I don't want to go by myself. I don't really know the team. And, you know, I really don't want to go. And that it's. That's what he's done over and over and over. Mm. He said, no, you're going to go by yourself. I'm going with you. I will never leave you or forsake you. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I'm going with you. Be of good courage. (laughs) Yeah. The way that the promises of God come in. I will never leave you or forsake you. And it's like your head knows that. All the while, you're not, it's not like you're going, I believe that wholeheartedly. It's no I'm going to obey this calling yeah. while I am telling you, you're never leaving me or forsaking me, right? You're not going to leave or forsake me, right? You're not going right. to just this mantra, this right. continual prayer to to the Lord where I say, uh, I believe, help me in my unbelief. You know, yes. that's basically what it is, right? Yeah. You know, yeah. And then you find yourself <laughs> in <Yeah>. Moscow. <laughs> yeah, fine. <laughs> sure, I'll go for um, 18 months. 14 years later, I come uh-huh. home. <laughs> but, you know, in that, as I was packing up and getting ready to go, because um, I had finally said, yes, I would go, I went because I knew that God wanted me to go. And he had promised to be with me. And I knew if I didn't go, I wouldn't be punished because Jesus has already been punished for me, for my sin. But I wouldn't have the sweetness of that intimacy with him. Hmm. There would be something between us. Uh, and I didn't want that. He had become so sweet to me then that it helped me push through that fear and hold on to that belief. Okay, he's going to go with me. It reminds me of something Dallas Willard said, describing what it means to grieve the spirit. Yeah. He said, it's like if you walked into a party and and the life of the party was over on the other side of the room. Everyone's surrounding Jesus, the life of the party. Mm-hmm. You know, everyone's surrounding him. And when you walk in, he goes, <gasps> he sees you yeah. and his eyes light up. He goes, hey, you get over here. <laughs> get in this. Give me a hug. Get over here. And you go, no. <laughs> and you turn away. Yeah. Yeah. That's- the life of the party goes, oh, bummer. Mm. That's grieving the spirit. That's you know. That you're missing really out. Good, yeah, missing out. You're missing out, mm-hmm. and you you had tasted enough where you were like, I don't want to miss out on this party. Yeah, <laughs> I don't. That's really I don't really foresee a party being in in Moscow. But <laughs> if that's where the party's at, okay, let's go. I'm in. <laughs> you're in. Fourteen years later. Yeah, four, yeah, yeah. That's that's a really good picture, Jim. Yeah, yeah. it's Dallas Willard, man. Yeah, that's that beautiful. Good. Yeah, because that's really what it's been. Becoming more and more convinced that um, you know the party's with Jesus. Yeah. And I don't want to miss it. Yeah. So there was one other beautiful thing that happened while you were in Brno. We don't yes. talk about Brno, but we're talking about it. There's <laughs> one other beautiful thing that happened. <laughs> All of these little stories that you tell are just so pleasing to me because I get to see the fruit. Mm. I I'm like I, I get to bear witness to the fruit of a life lived mm. following Jesus into the party. Mm. So tell me about tell, tell us about that yeah, one. Yeah. Yeah. So this group um, in life that we uh, have that surge um, has been partnering with, the founders of it uh, were there the first day. And we met them, I met them uh, within a couple of hours of being there. And the wife had heard that I speak some Polish, and so she greeted me in Polish. And I had this deja vu feeling of, I know this woman. I've met this woman before. And I just kind of tagged it because I I couldn't really put the pieces together. You've been all over. Yeah. But later... Uh, <laughs> Later, when we were talking, um, I spent 1986, 87 in Poland for one year that was under um, communism. Uh And so 
I was there um, teaching English at um, Yag- Yagalonian University. That was my cover. You do but that I not because really, you weren't a good English teacher. Yeah, but because <laughs> that was my cover. Right, right. Yeah, um, but I was really um, training Polish crew staff women and really helping them get grounded in um, ministry. So, you know, we were doing this um, secretly behind the secret police's back Mm -hmm. and all that. Um, And there were some Czechs who had come to Christ and they would sneak over the border to come to our training times. And this woman was one of the ones who sneaked so, over the border. So amazing. <laughs> so amazing. So when we started saying, well, do you know, do you know, so and so and so and so, we were, she would like, oh yeah, we were there at the same time. And they were, she was one of the ones who kind of, you know, sneaked over. And then she went back, she and her um, husband founded In Life, which was really birthed out of our crew That's amazing. work in Poland. That's amazing. <laughs> so for the Lord to give me that little picture, I was like, oh my gosh. Exactly. I would have never known that. <laughs> But years later, you know, this is how you bring everything together yeah. in such a beautiful mosaic. Yeah. Um, right. Yeah. The, the kind of party that the life of the party is making... Yeah. Is beyond our comprehension. Yes. And if if we decide I don't want to uh I don't want to spurn the spirit. I don't want to mm-hmm. I want to follow the spirit. When the, when Jesus calls me into the party, he's calling me into something of like, "Hey, hey, hold this while I do this." All right? Yeah. Just like watch. I mean, it does some sort of magic trick, yeah. right? Yeah. Hey, Laurel, uh, pick a card. You know, well, I don't know, just <laughs> yeah. some sort of like, what are you doing? You know, yeah. what are you doing? Yeah. Yeah. Um, and then every once in a while, he gives you a glimpse of what yeah. he's been up to and like, hey, keep going, keep going. Yeah. Uh, you saw this, you saw me do this. You'll see all the things, the mosaic, the tapestry that I'm weaving, mm-hmm. the, the beautiful things that I am making as I'm making all things new. Mm-hmm. And you get to be with me. You get to participate with me as I'm making all things new. Yes, that's so cool. That's yeah, so cool. it's amazing. Yeah. Well, when someone says, I don't know, I don't know if, the, if God loves me, what do you say to them? I'll usually ask another question, something like, um, well, if God were looking at you right now, what would the um, expression on his face be? Um, they might say different things. Um, but I, I, would, I would use that to kind of jump off um, and say, you know, he does love you. And I understand what it's like to have a disconnect. Mm. there from our good theology to mm-hmm. our heart and you need to stop start um, talking with him about that yeah you need to start asking him to really show you what it is that's under that um, expression whatever it is you know what's what are the currents the deep currents in your heart uh, where are you looking for um love in all the wrong places you know where are you where are you running where is your heart running uh when the only place to be deeply satisfied with our longings the way we long to be satisfied is in jesus yeah yeah psalm 124 i think is what it was let the morning bring me word of your mm. steadfast love show me that you love me you know and so often when he when he begins to show us his love he shows us what we've been loving instead right you know yeah and when we go oh i i do love that hmm because he pierces into our hearts we could so easily fall into cynicism mm-hmm. or whatever you know yeah. whatever kind of like yeah argument with with the lord that we might have but to really sit with that question do you love me well yeah you know i love you Below all the stuff that doesn't love you, mm-hmm. deep, deeper, mm-hmm. in the deepest recesses of my heart, you mm-hmm. know where the spirit is kindled a fire. You know that I love you. Yeah. And and then he just begins to w- work this. Okay, I'll show you. Um, you haven't been loving me in this area, in this area. Oh, yeah, you're right. 
but I love you. I still love you. Yeah. You really love me? Even even when I've been making a mess of my life in all these ways? Yeah. Yeah. Huh. I think I do love you. (laughs) You know, so I, I, you love me? Yeah. I've always loved you. Since, how did your pastor put it? Oh, God is eternal. So he will never stop loving you because he never started. Yeah, he always did. He always did. Yeah. yeah yep. Yeah. That's time right. time is of no consequence for right. for an eternal God who has always loved you. Yeah. yeah. I've always loved you. Oh, I think I love you too. Yeah. And so there's this kind of climbing out of this hole that we've dug for ourselves. Mm-hmm. Uh, dry and cracked cistern that holds no water. Right. right. <laughs> you know, as we go back and find living water. I mean, yeah, it's just so beautiful. Yeah, it is. It is. And walking with Jesus is a great adventure. Yeah. You never know what he's going to do, where where the party's going to be, like you're saying. You have so many stories. I want to hear more stories, but we're we're kind of out of time. So I guess I'll just have to hear more stories later. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Thank you so much. Oh, it's been delightful. Yeah. And if I can be that older single woman walking with jesus to help younger generations well and me i'm all in me yeah. and and yeah. pastors all over it's just really it's it's an honor oh thanks so, jim thank you you know it takes time for a tree to bear fruit sometimes the really abundant harvest takes a lifetime to cultivate and at harvest time People come from all over to experience the blessing of that harvest. Well, with Laurel, I feel like I'm witnessing a bountiful harvest of a lifelong love affair with God. Laurel is bearing much fruit, and it's so fun to watch. You'd be amazed at the number of pastors and ministry leaders who are coming to her for advice. And it's such an honor to get to do ministry with her. And I hope you were encouraged by her stories of discovering the great love of God in the unlikeliest places. And as you go, may you experience the love of God in a profound and mysterious way so that you can be a blessing to a world that is in desperate need of generous friends. So may the Lord bless you and keep you, make his face to smile down on you. May the Lord be gracious to you and turn his bright eyes to you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one God, life everlasting. Amen. Amen.